Attention all shiver seekers. This is The Dark Oak, the weekly thrill and chill inducing podcast for both true crime junkies and casual mystery fans. We are your hosts, Stephanie and Cynthia, and every Wednesday we will present to you a true tale of the supernatural, the macabre, criminal minds, cryptids, the unexplained, and the downright spooky. We will be sure to throw in some real-time reactions, including gasps and a few giggles as we explore the hair-raising world around us. Head to our webpage, thedarkoak.com, to learn more about us and find our podcasts wherever you like to listen. The Dark Oak is waiting. Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the devilish unknown? I'm Cynthia. And I am Stephanie. You have found the Dark Oak. Today we're going to hear about Jeanette De Palma. Her story has some wild twists and turns. And in the end, it's not a case you probably would have heard of before because it was silenced pretty quickly um, after it came to light. Oh. Yeah. So we're going to hear all the details about that and see if we can figure out what happened. Okay, tell me more. All right. On September 19th, 1972, around 11 o'clock, patrolman Donald Schwett received a call from base requesting assistance at the newly built Baltrusel Gardens apartment complex in the sleepy mountain town of Springfield, New Jersey. When he arrived, he was flagged down by the building's elderly superintendent. She told him she found a human arm just down the steps from her apartment, oh, lying gosh. on the lawn. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, again, sleepy mountain town. So Patrolman Schwett first thought it was a prank. He thought it would be a mannequin's arm. A few of the kids that lived in the apartment complex had been particularly cruel to the superintendent Aww. and had been throwing trash in her yard and playing practical jokes on her. Okay. So he figured, okay, this is going to be like another joke. This poor older lady, she doesn't know what she's doing. I'm sure it's nothing to sure. worry about. Yeah. So he rolls up. He finds a superintendent. He's led to the grassy area, which was the reason for the call. There, resting at the bottom of the steps, was a decomposing human arm. Oh, my gosh. Yes. After taking a few pictures of the arm, Patrolman Schwett ran back to his patrol car and called for backup. Minutes later, several additional officers arrived at the scene. The superintendent was asked if she had any idea as to how the arm came to be on the lawn, to which she answered no. Additional screening of residents yielded information that a neighbor had allowed her Dalmatian out for a morning run. It was concluded that the dog had likely brought the arm home from wherever he was roaming. As the officers stood over the arm, allowing a pit to sink into their stomachs, one officer leaned to the other and said, I think this could be Jeanette De Palma. Hmm. She's the only missing person we've got in town, and she's listed as a runaway. Oh. Jeanette De Palma was born on August 3rd, 1965, in New Jersey, New Jersey, to Florence, a homemaker, and Salvatore De Palma, the owner and operator of D&D Auto Salvage in Newark. Jeanette was the seventh child born to a large Italian Catholic family, which would grow to a total of eight children with the birth of her sister, Cynthia, the following oh. year. Oh, I like her name. She was special. <laughs> Very clearly. <laughs> The De Palmas relocated to the township of Springfield in the mid-60s because it seemed like an ideal place to raise a large family. 
Starting in the 1950s and continuing into the 1960s, Springfield felt the residential housing boom. Many farmers began to sell off agricultural land to developers who began to peddle the American dream of the split mm. family floor plan. Springfield also underwent a cultural shift as many ethnic families, specifically Italian and Jewish families, moved in from larger cities like Manhattan and Long Island. The De Palmas were labeled by some of the original residents as outsiders and, quote, weird. They mostly kept to themselves in their own social circles. Reading between the lines, I feel like they weren't necessarily weird. They just didn't feel the need to go out and shake hands with everybody. Right. Like, they were just doing their own thing, living their own lives. Like, we don't feel the need to go and make friends with all these, like, uppity neighbors of ours. Sure. Yeah. Just being themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Jeanette had a tough time fitting in with the Springfield crowd mostly because she was described as a, quote, wild child. As far as I could tell, though, from all the research I did about her and all the interviews with her friends that I read, she was known as a wild child because she had more of a hippie attitude, which in the 1960s was not really um, looked well upon. Right, right. And... She liked to kiss boys <laughs> and she occasionally smoked some pot. <laughs> so she sounds fun. Yes. And I mean, clearly like party girl label. Yeah. I mean, but to give you an idea, I read a book on this case called Death on the Devil's Teeth and her best friend, Gail Donahue, was asked if she felt Jeanette was turning into this party girl that everyone described her as. And she told a story about she and Jeanette had snuck into her father's liquor cabinet and had snuck a sip of snops and maybe a little whiskey. <laughs> and Jeanette started jumping up and down saying, maybe we can get drunk quicker if we mix it up. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't really get the impression she's like going off the rails here. She's just not fitting into the stereotypical 1960s teenage girl mold. Right. Jeanette also didn't fit the mold of this bubbly high schooler, right? And she was darker complected, had dark curly hair instead of stick straight hair, which was the fashion of the time. She also had what some referred to as a sullen expression on her face, even when she was in a pleasant mood. Um, so my conclusion to that was, you know, she has RBF. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> I'm imagining a little Wednesday Adams. Yes. I mean, a, a bit like that. I mean, yeah. if you look at pictures of her, I mean, she's, you know, this beautiful, uh, you know, young girl. She's mm -hmm. got this olive complexion. She's got this, you know, I mean, a nice thick hair. Yeah. But yeah, just like, I don't feel the need to smile at everybody. Also, I'm going to give a shout out to all the girls who have been told they need to smile oh. by some well-intended but super creepy stranger. Like, <laughs> we don't need that. Okay? <laughs> Springfield's fragile view of Jeanette was complicated further by her family's movement away from the Italian-American Roman Catholic Church and toward the Assemblies of God Evangel Church. The De Palmas soon declared themselves born-again Christians, placing a social stigma on them in their very tight-knit conservative community. Family members and friends were shocked to hear that the new church home of the De Palmas was a Pentecostal church, oh. which included demonstrative teachings, hellfire and brimstone, speaking in tongues, and faith healing. Okay. I mean, it was, it, it really is. I mean, for those that are familiar with these, you know, Christian religions, I mean, they all essentially believe the same thing, but the way a Roman Catholic church conducts their, their services as opposed to a very lively, you know, Pentecostal church service are very different. Very different, yes. Exactly. And neighbors to response to this was to all of a sudden forget to include the De Palmas and cocktail parties and other community events so christ-like yes furthering the divide right. between the De Palmas and their neighbors on the morning of august 7th 1972 jeanette came downstairs for breakfast as usual 
It was at this time that her mother and father decided to reveal to Jeanette that her cousin, Lisa, had run away from home and had been missing for almost a month. The explanation for the delay in communicating this with Jeanette is that Lisa had run away several times before and they didn't want to unnecessarily upset Jeanette. Okay. So I don't think her parents were off in doing that. Um, Jeanette did not take the news very well, though, and was frustrated at her parents for withholding that information. So she stormed back up to her room and a teenage huff. After collecting herself a bit, she called her best friend, Gail. She explained to Gail that her mom had given her chores for the day and she wouldn't be able to get together with Gail like they had planned. Gail didn't take this news very well because the girls had a plan to get together with two boys they met at the park the day earlier. Oh, oh I remember those days. Don't you remember those days? <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, I mean, fun. Young love, giddy, silly, just, you know, I mean, exciting. Yeah, exciting. It's, just fun. Life was just fun. Yeah, just fun. Totally. So Gail says she basically begged. Jeanette like you've got to hang out with me with these boys I can't say no they're already on their way over so Jeanette acquiesced and said okay fine I'll hitchhike okay dun 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 it's a little like that yeah that was the last time Gail would ever speak to Jeanette even now in retrospect though Gail says she felt she had no reason to be concerned about Jeanette's decision to hitchhike. According to many young people across Springfield, this was an acceptable practice and not that unusual. It really was. It yeah. absolutely was. Um, and yeah, even growing up when I started to drive, I remember once me and my friend uh, picked up two hitchhiking boys. <laughs> really? We did. We did. I just recently told my mom, I'm 41, y'all, and I just recently told my mom and she told me I'm not allowed to hang out with Melissa anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you could have been a true crime case, Cynthia. <laughs> could have. I mean, we were like 16 and these boys were obviously 16. I don't know that they were even official hitchhikers. They were on skateboards, yeah. but when two cute girls went by, but so all that to say, like, now the idea of picking up a hitchhiker is, like, unheard of. You would never. Exactly. But back then in the 70s, that was absolutely not looked at the same way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Now, what happened after Jeanette called Gail is a bit of a mystery. We do know she called another friend to see if she would accompany her to Gail's house, but the friend declined. After this, Jeanette grabbed her purse and told her mother she was going to walk the three miles to the train station in Summit. From there, she said she would take a train into Berkeley Heights to see Gail. After visiting Gail, Jeanette would head to Brooks' department store to work her shift. Her mother, Florence, balked at the idea of Jeanette walking and offered to give her a ride, telling Jeanette she's too young to go alone. Jeanette shot back. I'm 16 now. Leave me alone, Mom. Hmm. Those were the last words she would say to her mother. Oh. I know. Teenage years. Teenage. I am hard. not looking forward to them with my kids. <sighs> At least, though, we both have boys because I've heard that teenagers are rough with girls. Now, I have a 19 year old son. So I went through those teenagers. Definitely weren't the easiest years, but it wasn't. I don't think like it is with girls oftentimes. So, well, it was pretty tough for Florence yeah. because unbeknownst to her, while she didn't even want Jeanette to walk, it turned out Jeanette wasn't even going to walk. She was going to hitchhike. Hitch right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The even more dangerous. Option, even more. Which she definitely would not have approved of. Right. But there Jeanette went out the door. After she leaves the house, the trail pretty much goes cold. When she did not return home that evening, her parents began to feel uneasy. Their daughter should have been home by now, and it wasn't long before both parents gave into their anxiety and started calling several of her friends. Not a single person they reached out to had seen or heard from Jeanette. Mm. With their worst fears coming to fruition, the De Palmas contacted the authorities. After contacting the Springfield Police Department, they were given the most infuriating feedback in the world. You want to guess? Oh, she ran away. She'll be back. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, you can't report it 24 to, hours. for 24 hours. Right. Mm. 
Mm. Yes, which is not true, not true, not true. And yeah. especially not true for a minor. Exactly. They said, sorry, nothing we could do. Call us back. Insane. And also she probably just ran away. Yeah. Like, don't worry. Don't bother us with yeah. this. Yeah. Basically, don't bother us Yeah, with this, we don't care. what they said. Yeah. When they were able to finally make a report, again, it was assumed by everyone that she was a runaway. Right. So the report was for a runaway, even though it does seem strange to report her as a runaway because all of her clothes were still in her room. However, because of, you know, Jeanette's rebellious spirit and all these kinds of things, it was determined that she just must have left. Clearly. I Cle mean, clearly. she kisses boys and, uh, and she may smoke pot. So, yeah. you know, obviously, obviously she's wild. She just does whatever she wants. <laughs> a nor it sounds like a normal 16 year old. Today. Yeah, I mean, it really Especially does. Especially, like, in the 70s. It really does. I mean, I it's such a disservice to her because every newspaper article that was written, you know, after the fact of this case was that she, almost that she was asking for it. You right. know, she was just wild. She was weird. She, you know, was an outsider. No. And it's like, come on, guys. Right. I mean, she's just trying to be a teenager. She's trying to find her way. She's trying. She's one of eight children. Right. Like, let her figure it out. Right. And you know what? Even if she was weird and an outsider and all that, totally. she's still a human being, a 16-year-old human being. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And annoying. Exactly. Now, rumors, several started by the De Palmas themselves, report Jeanette as running away to New York City. The reason for the De Palmas' belief that Jeanette moved to New York City is unclear. The thought that suburbanite girls were always attracted to big, sparkly cities, and Jeanette was no exception, seemed to be the general rule of thumb. These runaway rumors were so rampant and spread openly by both the De Palmas and the police detectives that Jeanette's best friend, Gail, became angry with Jeanette and her disappearance because she didn't understand why Jeanette didn't communicate her plans with her and didn't call her when she got there. Oh, like that's how much people were like, well, she ran away. She ran away. She ran Gail. away. I know. And Gail's like, what the heck? I thought we were best friends. Why didn't you ask me to go? Why didn't you tell me you were right. going? Why didn't you call me when you got there? Wow. So now playing devil's advocate in this, I'm thinking maybe everybody just kind of wanted to live in this protective bubble. It's easier to say, I think she ran away to New York City than to say maybe something bad happened to her. That's all, like, in my mind. That's yeah. all I can think to to explain this. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I can see that. I don't know that that would be the path I'd go down. But okay. Yeah. I, again, playing devil's advocate again. Right. I don't know that I would have done that. But I'm like, why? Why? They don't want to believe the worst. They don't want to believe so the worst. So I would That's certainly exactly right. hope that she ran away to now, New York. Now, why the fine. police department decided to just be like, yeah, sounds good to us. <laughs> One. I mean, one less case to work on. Exactly. Exactly. Six weeks passed wow. with no word from Jeanette and no word about her whereabouts. That is until an arm oh. appeared on the lawn of an apartment building in Springfield. Oh, man. Upon confirming the arm was indeed human, Abba had been brought to the scene by a dog. Patrolman Schwert joined his fellow patrolman in a search of the grounds. After some time, the search led them into a nearby quarry owned by the Hoodale Construction Materials Company. While walking along, a new roadbed lay next to the quarry. They found the upper part of the arm, which must have fallen off as the dog was running. The search party left the roadbed and moved into the more densely wooded hills inside the quarry. A particular hill caught their attention. This knoll is made of two rocky, slippery sides. The other two sides make up a steep, sharp drop-off. For decades, rainwater collected at the top of this small hill, shallowing out a small pit in the center. Eventually, the collection of rainwater brought out mice and squirrels who would often drown in the mucky basin, leaving buzzards to constantly circle overhead. Mm. I'm painting a picture here. Yes. In the summer, when the waters evaporate, the hill would take on an appearance of the inside of an inverted half skull. Additional rock dumps form what look like teeth in the rocky crags. It is because of these strange and ominous features that the small hill 
became known to locals as the devil's teeth. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Is there a picture? Yes. Okay. I will show you. All right. It is atop this knoll that they found the body Aww. of Jeanette De Palma. I mean, if this is not, I mean, a scene from like a horror movie. Yeah. I don't know what is. A hill that looks like a skull. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll share it with you and I'll share it with our listeners, yeah. too. It is, it's ominous looking. It's very <sighs> ominous. Schwerf was the first to the top. He reported the ascent being very difficult, pulling on shrubs and little trees to get to the top. But there, in front of him, was the badly decomposing body of a 16-year-old girl. The body was laying face down on a flat area, with her head resting peacefully on on her remaining arm. The body was wearing a blue t-shirt and tan slacks, the exact clothing Jeanette was last seen wearing. The body had no shoes or socks on, but tan thong flip-flops were laying next to the body. According to officers at the scene, there was a small cross made from sticks laying on the ground above her head and some stones arranged around the top of her head, almost like a halo. Oh, oh, this took a turn. Yeah. The body was removed from the top of the cliff via assistance from a ladder truck supplied by the fire department as the sides were so steep that it wasn't safe to try to move the body downhill that way. Wow. At her autopsy, a cause of death was not immediately apparent. There was no evidence of bone fractures, bullet wounds, or knife strikes. No drug paraphernalia was found on or around her body. For undisclosed reasons, the coroner suspected that strangulation was the cause of death, leading the Union County Prosecutor's Office to treat the case as an unsolved homicide. The coroner also discovered an unusually high amount of lead in the remains, but no explanation was found for this occurrence either. Now, I did read down the road some other analysts, and what is thought is one explanation for this could be that the soil from the quarry itself may have been contaminated with lead and just her decomposing body they kind of like melded together so it looked like the lead was in her body i was going to ask that with her being found in that kind of environment if maybe there was it's highly possible there were also some other speculations about how her dad worked with some of these materials and could it be like it came on his clothing, but it was way too high even for that. And so they couldn't find any other reason. Right. So I think it may have just been environmental, right. like where her body was yeah. found. That's and, kind of my And also back in the 70s, I don't know if we were still using lead paint, but. Yeah, but she was 16. I don't know. Was she yeah. in paint? You know? uh, yeah, I guess not. Okay. You know, maybe right. she's a baby. I don't know. The only personal effect missing from her body was a small cross necklace. Hmm. Now. Are you with me so far? I, I need you to hold on. Oh, no. Because here's actually where it gets weird. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ten days after Jeanette's body was discovered, the Elizabeth Daily Journal published an article entitled, Girl Sacrificed in Witch Right? Question mark. Hmm. It reads, Investigation into the death of a 16-year-old Jeanette De Palma is focusing on elements of black witchcraft and Satan worship. A review of death scene photos, according to reports, is leading authorities to believe the girl's death may have been in the nature of a sacrifice. Pieces of wood at first thought to be at the scene by chance are now seen as symbols. Detectives throughout Union County have been alerted to the possibility that a cult or a cult member played a part in the death. A search party discovered her remains. She has been missing six weeks on September 19th in a wooded area of Hudel Quarry atop a 40-foot cliff about 400 yards from Shunpike Road. One searcher said two pieces of wood were crossed on the grounds over her head. More wood framed the body like a coffin, another person who was there said. I guess if you were looking for signs, they were there. The fact that you, even the way, like you said, she was laying like 
I kind of thought was interesting, like laying on an arm. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that means anything, but I don't, I don't know. Cause she, I'm assuming was, well, I would have assumed she was placed here after death, but maybe not. Maybe she was sacrificed here. Oh, I mean, uh, one thing I will say for sure is this article, mm -hmm. this little small snippet right. written by who knows the actual author of it. Right. But produced, um, you know, published by this, uh, the Daily, the Elizabeth Daily Journal, changed the whole course of the investigation. Oh, mm -hmm. right. Yeah it, yeah. it literally probably turned it into a witch hunt. Exactly. Mm. Now, speculation about Satan, witches sacrifices and the occult overshadow each aspect of the case more and more rumors and articles speculating that Jeanette was the victim of an occult sacrifice carried out either by satanist or a local coven of witches i mean it was just more and more it's very like the west memphis Three. It's exact. Yeah. I feel like this is almost the precursor to that. Yeah. But not many people are aware of this case. No. Because, I, I mean, it, it was huge for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then, it, I mean, it just fizzled out. Whatever the original source of the occult rumors may be, the media had done its damage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was mm -hmm. done from yeah. here on out. As far as anyone was concerned. A satanic cult or a coven of witches had murdered a 16-year-old girl and left her body in the woods, surrounded by a multitude of strange objects. And each account, article, and word-of-mouth declaration, each one was more intricate than the last. It became commonly believed that Jeanette's body was surrounded by small crosses made of sticks and four large downed trees were placed around her body. Two. So, like, one above her head, like, running, um, like, horizontal to her head. Okay. So, like, across her head, not pointing out, but, like, mm -hmm. like going across. One parallel to it at her feet. And then two along her body. But this wasn't true? Well, this is what everybody believed to be true. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, this was common knowledge. Okay. Even there were police. Trees. Were, like, absolutely. She's like, so these down trees, trees. There were there four trees. One above her head and her feet, uh, you know, two above her head and her feet and two along the sides of her body, simulating like a coffin. Sure. Some rumors even painted the picture of a stone altar built next to the body. I'm going to show you a picture here. Okay. And, um, okay, let me just pull it up real quick. All right. So this image I'm showing you right now is a illustration from the book Death on the Devil's Teeth. And it shows three different depictions of the crime scene. Mm -hmm. There's the first one, which shows what um, the police and specifically detective or uh, pr patrolman Schwert says. So there's the body laying face down, the, the head laying on her arm. And then there's the small cross above her head. And then like that little halo yeah. of stones. Stones. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the next one to the right is a sketch from one of Jeanette's cousin, Lisa Trek Grule, who scaled the devil's teeth two days after Jeanette's body was removed in order to say goodbye. Okay. So she climbed up there. And what she said is she could literally see, like, the darkened area where Jeanette's body had been. Okay. Because, you know, I mean, she had been there yep. for a while, right? Yep. So the body had left, you yep. know, kind of its its imprint, if you will. Yeah. And then she could see where everything was placed around it. According to her, there was the large tree above the head, the large tree at the feet, and actually the feet would have been resting on the tree, like the trunk. Yep. That's what I see here. Yep. And then around the body, instead of just the one cross made of sticks above her head, there are little sticks, like little crosses made of sticks surrounding the body. Like um, how many? 30? Maybe 30 little, little sticks. Yeah, 20 to just, 30, yeah. like little crosses made of little sticks. Yep. But by in no way accident like this would have definitely been purpose absolutely absolutely these yeah. weren't like sticks no. that just fell like any one was, of these three this was intentional yeah exactly these mm -hmm. were placed here intentionally right and then the third one was reported 
from the newspaper. It was an illustration given by the newspaper. This is a report from the newspaper. And what it has, it's very similar to Lisa's account, but it has the addition of the large trees along the side forming that kind of like coffin box look. And then a larger cross at the very top. And then a larger cross at the very top. So it's kind of a mix between the two. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. But the bottom line is these all look very different. Very different. Yeah. And I will post this picture so you guys can see. I mean, it is, it's wild to me um, that these can all be so different. So the police say the first one with the stones. Yes. The cousin who went up there after says the second one. And the newspaper reports the third. Yes. So I would be inclined to believe the police and or the cousin right right i mean what i mean but the cousin and the newspaper line up the most they're the most similar right. wow interesting right interesting right the springfield detective bureau and the sheriff's also office all did little to squelch any of the occult rumors as a matter of fact according to again the book death on the devil's teeth in early october the De Palma family received a rather disturbing piece of news. On Saturday, September 30th, it's very, I mean, very soon after her body is mm-hmm. found, members of the Springfield Police Department allegedly brought a witch to the top of the devil's teeth. The supposed witch, who is said to have been a local school teacher, was, according to reports, brought to the clifftop in order to examine the, quote, occult symbols that were found around Jeanette's body. The Elizabeth Daily Journal, the Newark Star Ledger, and the Daily News all reported on the incident. Wow. So this isn't like a one-off. Right, yeah. This like is... all the large New Jersey publications. Florence De Palma was particularly horrified in this rumor as she feared that her daughter would be resurrected oh. by this witch oh. and not told of her demise. Okay. At this point, Jeanette's mother was thoroughly convinced that the person responsible for her daughter's death was possessed by a demonic being. Once reports of the, the detectives collaborating with practitioners of witchcraft hit the front pages, though. The Springfield Police Department immediately ceased providing any useful information to the press. And confronted with the rumors of bringing the witch to the top of the devil's teeth, the collective response was no comment. Wow. Wow. And here's what's interesting. Looking at that photo... The first depiction apparently taken by the police, like I could read that completely different. I read that more that it was either somebody she knew or somebody who maybe had some kind of regret after the fact, because it's almost like a headstone type or like a memorial marker of some sort, maybe not demonic or occultish at all. It may just be like, it's a cross at the top of her head and then some stones around her head. I I completely agree with you. Right. It, yeah. I completely agree with you. So the, the fact that this is so sidetracked right. is mind-boggling right. to me. It was then further suspected that Jeanette herself might have been dabbling in the occult. Okay. <laughs> the reason for these rumors? She was once caught reading a book that talked broadly about the devil. Okay. Now, this basically... The Bible? (laughs) (laughs) Well, right. Now, again, self-admittedly, they were part of a very passionate Pentecostal church. Right. Where they believed in dark forces. Sure. They talked about the devil. They talked about the real devil's influence on their life. So, and she even kind of hung out with a crowd that even called themselves like the Jesus freaks. Like they were really into it and passionate about it. And so, you know, when you talk about, you know, as a Christian, their spiritual warfare and things like that. Sure. I don't know. The fact that she had a book that kind of talked about the devil, like that's not very condemning to me. No, no. And and silly, quite frankly. Right. I think that's silly. Right. To say that she, she orchestrated this or. Right. I I mean. Need more information on this book. Yeah, clearly, clearly. But de- but definitely learning about something doesn't make you a fan or yes. a follower. or Yes. And further placing blame on Jeanette was the speculation 
from the detective bureau that Jeanette, because of her wild child reputation, may have overdosed on hard drugs. In their recreation of events, Jeanette overdoses with some local teens who then freak out and dispose of her body in the quarry. Like, they weren't originally there. They were just at some party, a house party. Because even the detectives admit the quarry was not a hangout spot for teens. Okay. Like, that's not somewhere that they went right. to party. There were definitely those areas of town. Sure. But this was not somewhere that teens would have been hanging out. Okay. So if her body ended up there, their idea was somehow she went to a party, she overdosed, and the teens needed to dispose of her body. The issue I have with that is, do you remember the description of the devil's teeth? Right. It's very hard to scale. They couldn't even remove her body safely. So, so. How, how are teens going to drag her dead weight up the hill? Right. Yeah, that doesn't really seem very... Not likely. Yeah. Right? The only true lead that I was able to find that detectives follow include a homeless golf caddy known simply as Red. He worked at a neighboring golf course, and because of his odd nature and transient status, he appeared as a possible suspect. But he was very quickly ruled out. And that was the entirety of the police investigation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Knocking let's it out of the park. Let's bring a witch in, and then uh, look at this homeless man. I would like to quickly run through people they did not investigate. Please. <laughs> Number one, her parents. Sure. I mean, didn't even really consider them. However, upon receiving news that their daughter was deceased, they showed no emotion. Oh, that's odd. Only two days after the discovery of her daughter's remains, Florence told the Newark Star Ledger that she had, quote, already resigned herself to her daughter's death weeks before. She again, quote, the, said, quote, the Lord had given me peace. I don't understand it, but I trust God and I just still have faith. Two days after her remains were found. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea that she could get there, but um, and I do agree that probably after six weeks, you might think the worst has happened, but I cannot imagine that upon having that confirmed, you wouldn't have any kind of response. And then to be so at peace, maybe in shock two days after, but um, yeah, I, that's hard to imagine. Mm hmm. Also, any of her past romantic relationships. Because she clearly had so many that boy kiss her. Even if she was only <laughs> kissing boys. Right. As far as anyone's... Nobody. No, no one was interviewed. Right. Not her friend. Yeah. Not her... Like, nobody. So, like, not even investigation was done. No. Like, nothing. No. No. Mm -mm. Now, just for the sake of argument. Okay. Let's assume the occult symbols, I'm using air quotes here. Mm -hmm. Let's assume the occult symbols were present at the crime scene. While it is obvious that no two people agree on what was and was not found around Jeanette's body, numerous occult historians happen to agree on one matter. The items that were reported to be arranged around the corpse, while certainly strange, were not satanic or related to witchcraft or Wiccan in any way. I was going to say, I don't think... It's crosses. a cross. It's a cross. It's a cross, you guys. Right. They're crosses. Yeah, I think um, I think when you start looking to a cult, maybe an upside down cross, which these were not. Exactly. These You're were... exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. So um, Professor Ronald Hutton, of who's the world's leading authority on the history of mm -hmm. witchcraft. I'm not sure who gave him this title, but that's the title he has. Okay. Um, said, quote, there is no pagan imagery here at all, and none from any established tradition or ritual magic, end quote. Dr. Jason P. Coy, professor of history at the College of Charleston and a renowned expert in the field of witchcraft, also sees no occult connection. I do not see anything that indicates any satanic or witchcraft activities. For starters, I do not think there are or have ever been any organized Satan worshippers who practice ritual murder, apart from the fantasies of Hollywood writers yeah. or sensational journalists. Witchcraft involving ritual murders 
is practiced in parts of the developing world today in places like Africa, but does not seem to have anything to do with this case. Modern day witches or Wiccans have nothing to do with historical witchcraft and are generally peaceful environmentalists and feminists who practice a sort of new age neo-pagan rel religiosity. This looks more like the work of some psychopath with a type of religious fixation. If some killer or killers were deluded and believing they were carrying out some sort of half-baked satanic ritual, I would expect them to employ the much more common upside-down mm. pentagram motif. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, to me, this seems more just like a crazy person, just like doing creepy stuff. Doing creepy stuff. Yeah, exactly. Now. If you aren't already asking the question over and over in your head, I will help you. Why don't we just look at pictures of the crime scene? Okay, I was going to ask, <laughs> where are the pictures? Where are the pictures? Why are we speculating? Why mm -hmm. are we looking at these drawings? Why are we consulting newspapers? Why don't we just look at the daggum case file? Well, we would if any were ever made available. So they have them. They just don't make them available? That's right. Oh. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So sometimes pieces of information are kept close to the chest so that, you know, uh, if, if somebody knows something, obviously, then they shouldn't know. Then, hey, okay, that might tell us something about this person. But this is like 50 years ago. Decades, Cynthia. Yeah. So, like, at and this people point, are still asking, like, yeah. "Hey, you think we can get something now?" Right. It's probably okay to release some of this information. Yeah. So, continued requests for any information related to the De Palma case have been denied. I wonder why. In 2003, the authors of The Death on the Devil's Teeth, and I know I keep referencing this book because I will tell you it's one of the only ones I could find on this case yeah, because there's just such a lack of information. They requested as much information about the case in order to write this book, and everyone was met with a denial. Eventually, the denial started saying that all records pertaining to her case had been destroyed in 1999 as a result of Hurricane Floyd. There was a lot of flooding. Okay. They said they'd lost a lot of records and her case was one. It just all went down in flames. But then more information started coming out. There were these additional leaks from the Sheriff's Department that that file was not destroyed. It's just wild, right? In 2019, a local publication called Weird NJ, so Weird New Jersey, okay, uh -huh. right? Weird NJ submitted a detailed file request under the New Jersey Open Public Records Act and the Freedom Information Act and finally got <gasps> results. Oh, okay. After decades of denials and excuses of damage, lost files, both pictures and records were handed to the press. Oh, my gosh. Okay. The following is a quote from Weird NJ's website. Okay. While Jeanette's remains have been compassionately redacted from the photographs, the picture they paint is very clear. After a careful review of these photographs, Weird NJ feels confident that there was no occult activity involved in Jeanette's death. The alleged crosses made from sticks and twigs and halo of stones that were supposedly found placed around Jeanette's body are completely absent from the crime scene photos. What? None. Completely absent. The closest object resembling a cross near the remains are two rotten tree branches that had obviously fallen in that spot a long time before Jeanette had come to rest there. No arrows carved in trees or an altar of any sort are seen in the photographs either. So this poor girl was just murdered. Yes. Dumped somewhere. Yes. 
And instead of trying to figure out what really happened, we went off and lost the plot big yes. time and made up this whole, literally went on a witch hunt. An actual witch hunt. And okay, I can understand, like, if there are clues that make you think that could be a possibility, exploring that possibility, but not to the point where you exclude any other possibility like you said interview her parents interview romantic lovers uh i don't know we know that she went hitchhiking hello let's try to figure out hello has anybody did anybody see her get picked up like yeah. all valid points and they wow. were murders in this town around this time that involved you know women that were hitchhiking and stuff i mean there was actually even a serial killer around that time that you know supposedly took credit for the crime but it's never been confirmed and you sure. know i mean who knows Additionally, the overgrowth itself is another revelation. For years, Weird NJ has been told time and time again by retired Springfield PD investigators that the spot where Jeanette's body was found was a, quote, party spot, and that she likely overdosed there while partying with several other teenagers. And again, I didn't actually find even where they said it was a party spot. But right. again, police were just like, well, probably. Right. We don't yeah. know. All of whom presumably fled out of fear of prosecution instead of rendering the medical aid. The death scene photos tell an entirely different story. The spot where Jeanette's body was discovered is much more overgrown than ever previously described to us, with countless large plants and bushes surrounding the remains. No evidence of a, quote, party or any other social gathering is noted in the accompanying evidence reports or seen in the multitude of photographs released in February of 2000, uh, 2021. Wow. So the these people just bumbled it and just didn't care. Didn't care. Didn't care. Yeah. Obviously, the release of this monumental, you know, the release of this information is just monumental for the Jeanette's family, friends, sure. readers who have been following this case for decades, wanting to know what happened to her, not believing for a second that it was the occult. Now, many questions have been answered. There's certainly no reason to believe the occult was involved however as with most revelations in this case more questions have now arisen first of all how did anyone i mean inside the springfield police department or the union county prosecutor's office sincerely believe there was an occult element into this case yeah what did they see that caused what them on to... earth yeah what yeah i don't Why? Even know what? <laughs> Why? Did they literally, I mean, it's like they read the newspaper article and instead of actually looking at the facts, we're like, right. well, guess that's true. Have you seen the photo, the actual photos that have been released? I have. Oh, uh, I want to see. Okay. I mean, is there anything that could be misconstrued? No. no. It's literally it's just... just her laying on like, I mean, it looks like a, like, like a forest bed. It's just sticks and twigs Weird. and leaves. No halo. No. No cross. No. Nothing. No. Wow. We're looking at it together. You tell me. Maybe you see something okay. that I don't see. Okay. I didn't see anything. Okay. Um. Also, why did so many police officials insist for almost half a century that Jeanette's case file and evidence had been destroyed? That's weird to me. It, they're hiding something. Some, something's being hidden. Isn't it weird? Like, I feel like all of these are like, so was this like an inside job? Do they know? Ooh. Like, do they know who did it? And they were just trying to, like, spin it and, like, point blame in a different way. Like, do they know? Maybe it was somebody inside the police force. Maybe oh. they know of somebody. Maybe they got paid off. I don't know. Or an informant who they didn't want to They yes. didn't want to lose the informant. Or maybe they just realized, oh, gosh, what they reported and what actually happened are so different. So, like, we have to hide this. This would be embarrassing, you know. Yeah. Because, like, the actual photo doesn't match up with the report at all. So, you know, maybe they were just trying to hide that. I don't know. That's weird. Right. Any of those. Yeah. But still, like, that's just really disheartening because it's like you want to, like, if you can't trust them, who can you trust? I know. Like. I don't know. I mean, the overarching question now is still the same question that happened 50 years ago. 
Who killed her? Who killed her? It could have been anybody. I'm my. I'm gonna go with whoever picked her up. Yeah. But we don't know. We, have we no don't know idea. what happened when she or walked out the door. it could have been even, you know, some kind of romantic relationship. Maybe he was like, hey, let's go to this hangout spot in the quarry. Yeah. But I don't know. Wow. Wild. And 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 sad. So sad. And so sad that just so much was lost that now they'll never get back. But, like, so yeah, more much than likely was not. lost. And, I mean, and, and so many memories have faded now. And, and even suspects i mean they're in the wind or they've passed away yeah it's been 50 years yes so um but yeah just if they just done the work in the beginning yeah like could we have had a different answer could we have had an answer i would have liked to think yes yeah wow that's awful yeah so you know the great thing that I learned through, again, reading this stuff on the devil's teeth is that people in New Jersey who live in this still town, in this small town, they really still want to help solve this case. Oh, good. And she's not forgotten. Good. Okay. You know? And I was very encouraged by that. And it, it, crazier things have happened, you know, deathbed confessions, sure. things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, the chances of finding her killer, I mean, while not great, it's not impossible. True. And you know, we'll just keep listening out and, and yeah. hopefully they find out what happened to her. Oh, yes. This Please. 16 year old girl. My exactly. Gosh. Exactly. Oh, wow. What a crazy case. I'd not heard of that one. So they did do a good job of making it go away. Yeah. Yeah. They said um, it was, you know, in the news and went, I mean, just bonkers. Everybody wrote about it for about two weeks and then it just went cold. Wow. Like nobody talked about it again. Hmm. Yeah. And that's why these small, some of these smaller publications, you know, several decades later are like, whatever happened to that De Palma case? Yeah. And they're like, let's find out more about it. And then they were like, wait, why are we getting so many roadblocks? Why is this so weird? What's going on? And then it just makes you even more, right. you know, you know, wanting to get in their chili. Like, wait a minute. This is, the, justice was not served here. Right. Wow. Yeah. Hearing all of that does kind of make you think, could it have been somebody... I mean, and it makes you think, like, why would they want to cover it up? And right. why why point blame in these sections? The, things you so, know. So opposite direction. Like, how could they have possibly believed right. that this was a cult related? Right. And maybe they just got, like, I don't know. I, I was going to say maybe they got lucky that that, you know, the original publication wrote about being in a cult. But maybe that wasn't a mistake. Maybe that could wasn't a coincidence. Fed right, yeah. It could have been fed to them. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. What a case. Wild, That's right? crazy. Wild. Yeah. Okay. Well, folks, thanks for hanging in there with that one. I mean, it, I felt like it was like, you know, wild turns. It is. You got me. When, <laughs> wild twist and yeah, turns. you got me. Wow. Well, join us next week for more thrills and chills. Thanks for joining us at the Dark Oak. This has been a Just Us Gals production with artwork by Justice Holmes and music by Ryan Creek.